Why are we going to speak about diffraction? You have heard about diffraction probably one or two or three times already before in different lectures. And so maybe a large part of it might be uh, repetition here. Again, maybe you will hear it from a slightly, again, different perspective. That means from the perspective of um, how the whole diffraction theory and the contrast is related to the electronic structure. Now, why do we talk about diffraction at all in this lecture? Well, diffraction is a natural connection, especially the, uh, like say, X-ray diffraction is a natural connection uh, towards the very electronic structure of materials, right? And eventually also to the atomistic structure. So diffraction provides us uh, insight into the atomistic structure of materials. So let's, uh, let's start with the definition of what is diffraction. Diffra diffraction is a constructive interference of scattered beam of light on a grid. Okay. Now, what is this grid and what is uh, causing the scattering, what is causing uh, the change of, uh, uh, of the propagation uh, the direction of a light? Uh, this scattering for electromagnetic uh, waves for uh, X-rays happens with uh, interaction on material on on uh, happens with interaction with the electronic uh, structure of materials on the electronic cloud itself. And in order to observe any diffraction, you need to have a wavelength of the incoming wave comparable with the grid on which this diffraction happens. That means if we want to have a lattice structure, a periodic lattice structure, uh, that means crystal structure as a diffraction grid, we need the incoming light to have wavelength, which is similar to this, uh, uh, to this uh, spacing between the atoms to the periodicity of our grid. If you look at the uh, scattering, if you look at the diffraction of visible light, you would go to much larger wavelengths. If you then look at the, I don't know, scattering of other types of waves, this would be happening as well. You might even look at scattering, let's say, and, and diffraction of uh, waves on the, water on the water surface, but then you need to have a grid on which this scattering happens, which has a comparable wave uh, distance, comparable separation to the wavelength of your incoming, uh, incoming wave. Now, when we say our uh, grid has spacing comparable with the uh, lattice spacing with the uh, distance between atoms, then we speak about uh, the wavelength, which is in the units of angstroms. An angstrom is 10 to the minus uh, 10 of uh, meter, which means we are somewhere in the range of 10 to 100 picometers. And this brings us to the uh, request that the wavelength of our incoming light must lie in the range of uh, X-rays. The X-rays, as soon as we are speaking about the electromagnetic waves. And the electromagnetic waves, the photons, uh, they are interesting because they can interact with the electronic charge. And the electronic charge distribution is then the medium which causes the diffraction of the photons. We have here a couple of uh, everyday uh, applications of X-rays coming from the uh, security and healthy applications uh, up to the X-ray crystallography which is actually the inspiration for today's lecture that we want to talk about. So eventually we want to use the X-ray diffraction, the fact that this phenomenon happens 
as a proof that materials are crystalline, that the atomic spacing is really in the order of angstroms, as we spoke about before. So let us do a couple of assumptions. We will be talking about an electromagnetic wave, which is described by an electric field intensity that is described as a function of position and time in the space. So we have a full description of this wave in the space and time. And since it is a wave, we will describe it actually in the form of a plane wave in the form of this exponential function. Now, I do hope that such formulation is uh, familiar to you. It is the same kind of uh, expression that we have used last week for describing the uh, waves propagating in, in crystal when we spoke about the phonons, about the lattice vibrations. The fact that it is a plane wave stems from the fact that if you would make a snapshot, that means you fix the time, then all points in the space that have the same intensity are actually lying on a plane which is perpendicular to a vector k. That is why we call it a plane wave. We have planes of points in the space that have at each given time the constant uh, the constant amp uh, the constant amplitude of the uh, intensity of electric field, right? Uh, again, this is the same concept as what we have used for the uh, uh, for description of the lattice vibrations in crystals. K vector K uh, provides the direction of the propagation, so the direction of this vector um, defines the direction of the propagation. The k vector uh, is a vector in reciprocal space, but by such it defines a plane in the real space with the normal given by the vector k. The relationship between k vector length and the wave length is that they are uh, reciprocal. So the longer is the wavelength of our propagating wave, the shorter is the vector k, eventually leading to a, stand, uh, um, a long wavelength limit where lambda goes to infinity and k goes to zero. Uh, the important thing, as I said before, is to realize the relationship between the name plane wave and the relationship given by this k dot uh, r equals to constant, which actually defines the plane of points with a constant amplitude. So let's now have a look at what happens when a the, this incoming wave is scattered. Right? The scattering happens by interaction of the incoming beam with a charge at certain point in our material. So we have the incoming beam. That means these are planes, all of them with the same intensity and all of them described with the uh, wave equation given by uh, E to the I omega T minus kr. K and r are vectors, right? Uh, now, better would be here to describe this with capital R uh, vector. What we want to do is that we say, when we choose somewhere an origin of coordinates, and we now look at a beam scattered at a certain point, capital R, away from the original, how is the phase of this wave change with respect to the wave to the beam which goes through the origin? 
there will be a change of the phase because the phase distance that the beam has to travel through the point R uh, with respect to the beam that travels through the origin is longer by these two paths, right? So this is, this is the longer path, which causes eventually the uh, uh, desyn desynchronization of the waves. Now, the question is, if I look at the wave here and here, and I look at these two beams, what will be the difference in their faces? And it can be shown by very easy geometry that the difference between the beam which goes through the origin and the beam which goes through this point capital R is given by this formula. I put here capital R for a time being because we use the small r as the uh, overall descriptor in the space. So what happens for these two beams is that they change their phase by this factor where r I now come back to this uh, expression that you have here in the election notes, a small r, is a position somewhere in our specimen where the scattering happens. And delta k is the change of the wave vector. So r k is the direction in which the incident beam propagates. k prime is the direction, or actually the opposite direction, uh, at which I am watching the incoming beam. I might be also watching from another point, right? I might be watching also from here. This is simply my choice, which defines the direction of the K prime vector. Now it will turn out that in some of these directions, the phase change will be zero. In some of them, they will be pi. That means the two waves will actually become, and here I will have an extra uh, wave, will become, uh, oh, you, I've deleted too much. So once again, incident beam going through the origin, incident beam going through point R, and then at this point, I insert this extra phase path, which turns the uh, phase of my wave to the opposite. So from here, it will continue in the opposite direction. So when I now sum these two intensities, they will interact in a destructive manner, and I will not observe any intensity here for these two particular beams. In some other direction, the change of the phase might not be opposite and might continue exactly the same. And I will then see from these two guys a constructive interference. So my final intensity will be doubled, right? Or will be simply sum of the incoming. Good. Uh, so what I'm going to do is that I now say that the Intensity of a beam, which is scattered from this part, is proportional to the charge, the scattering medium, um, at this point. And eventually, all what I will do is that I sum up the intensities coming from all points from the space. Essentially, if there is vacuum at a certain point here, there is no intensity contribution in this field. If I have a lot of charge here and the charge causes the scattering, right? You can imagine it like having there a mirror which then uh, redirects my incoming beam into this direction. Then I have, of course, a lot of intensity in this direction coming from this point R. And now, uh, of course, the intensity coming from a certain point uh, is important for the final intensity. If I have two beams with opposite amplitudes, 
but one of them has a negligibly small amplitude. Of course, this red negligibly small amplitude will not nullify the amplitude from other place. So I will still observe an intensity in this direction, right? So what I need to do in order to figure out what is the intensity that my observer will see is to integrate over the intensities coming from all places in the space that are scattered in this direction. And I will say that the intensity is proportional to the charge density at that given point. What I do eventually is that I now integrate over all the phase changes and multiply these phase changes by the intensity at that given, uh, sorry, by the charge uh, density at that given spot point. That provides me with the intensity of the scattered beam in a given direction k prime. And this is all what I want to actually estimate what corresponds to the diffraction intensity that I will measure at the end of the day. So let us try to work with this a little bit. We said that the scattering medium is a charge density, it's a charge of electrons. And so now we take the advantage of saying that our scattering medium which defines the arrangement of the electronic charge is a crystal. So let us now suppose that indeed the atoms that define the distribution of the charge, that they are arranged on the lattice, something that we have assumed from the beginning, that we have how we have defined the crystalline structure. But now we are trying to say if diffraction really works, and this should be a proof of the crystalline uh, nature of materials, right? Because the whole process that we are building here is based on the assumption of having a crystalline structure underneath. So this crystallinity is nothing else in mathematical terms than a requirement that our charge density, charge distribution is lattice periodic. So when I move from a given point by any lattice vector, I will come to an environment in which the charge density has exactly the same distribution. That should remind you of something. In the first lecture, when we spoke about the crystalline structure, we ended up by pointing towards the usage of Fourier series in solid state physics. And indeed, if our charge density is crystalline, it's periodic, we can now employ Fourier series to describe it. So we can now say that our charge density, it is not necessarily a sine or cosine profile. It is any function with the request that it is lattice periodic. As soon as I move to another lattice side, I will be in exactly the same environment, exactly the same distribution of charge. And it means I can uh, describe it or expand it in one dimensions as uh, such Fourier series, as a series which composes of uh, sine and cosine functions that can be conveniently written uh, using the exponential functions with a complex argument. The charge density is a quantity, it describes the density of electrons at a given place x, and therefore the value that comes out of it must be a real number. We have number of electrons per volume. This is the density. And mathematically to ensure this, we must require this relationship for the uh, uh, for the for, for this uh, Fourier components for these Fourier factors. So if I now uh, go over all integer numbers p, the label the points 
on the 1D reciprocal lattice, then the coefficients, the Fourier coefficients of plus and minus P, plus and minus index, must be an complex conjugate numbers. It means if one of those is a complex number A plus IB, the other one will be A minus IB, where A and B are real numbers. The points that we have here is 2 pi over A times P. They form a one-dimensional reciprocal lattice. A reciprocal lattice to a one-dimensional direct lattice of points, which are all at the distance A. And I would label them uh, by integer numbers, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3 minus two and so on. It means it is a discrete set of real numbers, n times a, where n is an integer number and a is the spacing, the smallest spacing between those numbers. We can of course make a straightforward generalization to the 3D. Again, this is what we have mentioned in the first lecture, please, uh, I would then refer you to the slide on the Fourier series from our very first lecture for this. So in three dimensions, we now make the, uh, or we write the charge density of a crystal as a sum of a Fourier series, uh, Fourier coefficients and the exponential functions the individual coefficients of this Fourier expansion, Fourier series, be labeled by reciprocal vectors G, where the real lattice is given by vectors uh, A1, A2, A3. That means the real lattice vectors are given as uh, we write it n1 a1 plus uh, n2 a2 plus n3 a3 or in this uh, basis set of a1 a2 and a3 we simply label them by a triplet n1 n2 a3 okay now the reciprocal lattice vectors b1 B2, B3. We have spoken again about this in the first lecture. You have made the homeworks on these. So we know that, for example, the length of the B1 is reciprocal proportional to the length of the A1. The uh, direction of the B1. Uh, sorry. So it should be, what do I delete here? These guys I delete. Uh, so divided by the length of the B1, so the normal uh, direction is given by the vectors A2 times A3, right? And we would have to divide again by A2 times A3. So it's a normal uh, to the plane, that the vector B1 is normal to the plane given by vectors A2 and A3. And so the network of these reciprocal lattice vectors is a network of all vectors that have coefficients m1, or all, all points in the reciprocal space m1, b1, plus m2, b2, plus m3, b3, where m1, m2, and m3 are integer numbers. So it is, as I said, a straightforward generalization of the 1D case we have mentioned on the previous slide. We can now combine these two expressions. Once again, the expression for the, uh, uh, for the scattering factor, which we set F equals 
factor over the whole space, uh, integral over the whole space, charge density times exponential function a uh, minus delta k r dv, right? So this is now the contribution related to the phase change coming from a certain position. And now if we enter this Fourier expansion into this general formula, we end up with this equation. This is actually a critical equation for uh, estimating whether a constructive interference can happen or not. It actually turns out that in order to be non-zero, for this factor to be non-zero, we must have, uh, we must fulfill the requirement that delta k, so the change of the uh, wave vector, is equal to a reciprocal lattice vector. Only in that case, we get a non-zero contribution to the, or we get a non-zero value of the overall scattering factor f. Whenever delta k is different from reciprocal lattice vector, that means that all of those parts are non-zero, then eventually it can be shown that the integral and finally then the sum over these integrals will yield a um, zero value. Right? It turns out that in order for this uh, whole integral to be non-zero, we need to have this part as, uh, as constant, which is realized only by g equal to delta k. As soon as they are different, this part is non-zero. And what you are doing here is that you, again, in one dimensions, you would integrate over a sinusoidal function with different wavelengths corresponding to different uh, g minus delta k wavelengths or wave vectors and an integral over such an infinitely large sinusoidal function is equal to zero right so the only way how an integral of sine omega x is non-zero an integral over this over the x is non-zero is when omega equals to um, well this is a wrong right we would have here uh, cosine omega x plus i times sinus so that means that eventually we would have here that this equals to i omega x dx right so the only way when this is non-zero is when this is equal to zero by which we integrate a constant function So this is the intuitive understanding, where does this condition uh, appear? And uh, I leave this for you to prove this, if you really want to, that whenever delta k is different from g, then uh, the f will be identically equal to zero or approaching zero. So this leads us to the diffraction condition. Diffraction condition in probably the form that you haven't seen before, and that might be a bit new to you. We formulate now the diffraction condition in with this very simple formula that when the change of the wave vector of incoming and scattered beam is equal to a reciprocal lattice vector, then we expect we might have, uh, we might obtain constructive interference. Not always we will get, but this is the necessary condition for having a constructive interference. Let us now work on this a little bit more. 
And uh, we will now rewrite the integral from the first slide where we said the intensity, the scattering intensity factor is equal to the integral over the whole space, the whole volume of nr times exponent minus uh, i uh, minus i delta k dot r over the whole space. Now we enter here the diffraction condition. So we are interested only in the uh, directions in delta k equals to g when the constructive interference might be happening. So we then say that in these directions, we get the intensity n r e minus e g dot r b. All right. So this is now uh, the intensity in a direction in which the constructive interference might be happening when we fulfill the diffraction condition. And now let us enter in here the Fourier expansion or Fourier series for the charge density. So what do we get is that we have integral over the whole space times the sum over all reciprocal vectors G. And we should actually have here, uh, no, we don't enter here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm taking it back. Uh, we do not enter here yet the uh, Fourier series. We'll do something different. We will now say that actually the charge density or the whole space can be chopped into the unit cells. And they are identical with each other. So now this is a unit cell. And here I have another unit cell, another unit cell, another unit cell. So I have the whole network of unit cells. They are all with identical distribution of charge inside. And they are all uh, described, for example, by the coordinate of their corner. So I say this is a vector Ri. This is a vector, another r i plus one, for example. Okay, where r capital R are now the real space lattice vectors, and a charge at a general position r is then given by. So that is not the best position I have chosen. Let's choose, uh, let's choose. <laughs> you see, I'm missing the blackboard in which one can draw this much larger. Let's take, uh, let's take, oh, now I have deleted too much. Mm -hmm. So let us take again, this position as R and let us take this point small r which we are interested in. And eventually we will describe this as a position, uh, let's say raw at this point. I will then rename it again. Um, so our vector r is then Ri plus rho, where rho is a vector from the unit cell. Okay. That means that we can now uh, divide this whole integral, f equals integral over the whole space, n and r exponential r i minus g r over the whole space, we now divide it, or we rewrite it by uh, the sum over all cells, 
sum over all unit cells times integral over the unit cell. And then we have a charge density at that given position R. So this is now the vector R times exponential function minus G. So the minus should be in front times R, so rho plus capital R, R. D, E. Mm -hmm. So we have now uh, transformed the integral over the whole space to the sum over of the integrals over individual unit cells. Of course, that we can do. Right? If you think about integral as nothing else than a continuous sum, so it's clear that you can uh, use the associativity of this uh, of this process of this. Uh, operation and write it as a sum of integrals of uh, domains in the space that are not overlapping and that they are covering the whole space. That is what we have done here. And you eventually end up with using firstly the periodicity of the charge density, that means this is equal to the charge density at position rho times e to the minus i g rho times e minus g r r. Missing vectors. Now this last part is first of all independent of the integration variable rho. Second of all, remember what is the relationship between the reciprocal lattice vectors and the real space lattice vectors. Again, we have mentioned this in the first lecture and it's very easy to prove that this equals to one. So what we end up finally is, what should I delete? I will delete everything again. We end up finally with saying that F equals sum over all capital Ri integral over the unit cell and rho i to the minus g rho dv. And the last thing is to realize, well, this is something which is the same for all unit cells. So why not we label this integral S G, we call it structure factor, because eventually this integral is a function only of the G vector. And then we sum up over all unit cells in the contribution from each unit cell is identical. And so the final intensity is simply n times the structure factor, which is the intensity contribution coming from one unit cell. So we have now introduced a term called structure factor, which says, how does this whole uh, intensity, whether it's contractive or destructive, how does that, uh, how, how is that related from the whole crystal? to the intensity contribution coming from one unit cell. Unit cell, again, this is the uh, pattern of periodicity, repeating pattern in our crystal structure. To be able to write it in this way, we need it to have the charge density as a periodic function. That means we need it to be in the crystalline material. Good, if we know this, let's now focus a little bit more on this structure factor. Um, and we will do following thing. We will now say that the charge density uh, in our unit cell is to a large degree corresponding to a sum of the charge densities coming from individual atoms. 
we do not now want to dis, uh, discuss whether these uh, charge contributions from individual atoms are those from isolated atoms or from atoms inside the actual crystalline structure. And therefore, depending on the crystalline structure, depending on the chemistry, depending on how the bond is formed. Let's take this now apart and just say, if I have aluminum somewhere, I am able somehow to ascribe the charge density to this aluminum atom. And that means that the whole charge density uh, inside of the unit cell can be decomposed to a charge density coming from individual atoms and I, where a charge density at a given position R is now uh, given by a charge density from atom I. The atom I is positioned at, or we have here J, the atom J is positioned at position RJ. That means any point inside of the unit cell given by vector R can be decomposed also into, this is the vector, the atom uh, J, this is where the atom J sits. And all right, this is R minus RJ. So eventually the contribution to the total charge density at position R from an atom J is given by the atomic distribution, the charge corresponding to atom J uh, at position R minus RJ. And then we simply sum up over all atoms inside of the unit cell. This formula we are now going to insert in here. Right? Uh, so we are now trying to construct this structure factor out of contributions from individual atoms inside of the unit cell. So when we do this, we arrive at this formula, right? It is again, nothing else than entering these expressions in here and realizing uh, that the exponential function of minus i g r would be rewritten by the change of the coordinate for each uh, for each atom i as minus i g r minus r j. Okay. This is now what we have there plus uh, e i g r j. This is now the variable rho, which is written here uh, in this integral. And this is the prefactor we end up with in here. So eventually, all what we have done is that we, first of all, inserted the sum over the individual atomic charge densities uh, into the total charge density here. Then we know that we can swap the order of summation and integration. So that's what we have done here. And we end up then that for each atom J, we integrate over the charge density and actually a given vector G. By that, we arrive at another quantity called atomic form factor. So a uh, structure factor, this is something which is really related to the arrangement of uh, atoms inside of the unit cell. Uh, plus on top of that, we need to consider also what kind of atoms are sitting at individual positions. This is, this is what kind of atoms and therefore what is the actual charge distribution from that given atom. And that is uh, what is the contribution towards the scattering intensity 
This is given by the atomic form factor. We should realize here that, in fact, these atomic form factors also depend on the vector G. Right? So the atomic form factors are functions of the reciprocal G vector. This whole decomposition now leads us to a possibility to discuss whether the intensity will be zero, not because of not fulfilling the diffraction condition, all of the derivation on this slide and previous slide is done for the diffraction condition. So we say that we arrive actually at all of these formulae only in the condition that we have fulfilled the diffraction condition, that the change of the wave vector is equal to the reciprocal lattice vector. But now still the intensity is proportional to this formula that we have here, which relates to the arrangement of atoms and the type of the atom. So the chemistry and crystal structure of our crystal. And despite the fact that we fulfill the uh, necessary condition for diffraction, we still might get a zero contrast. We still might get a zero intensity of the scattered beam if the atoms are arranged in such a way that they will still their contribution from within the unit cell, they will cancel out each other's contribution. And this will be the part of your tasks for the homework. Again, um, eventually you have the solutions here. So it's uh, not, let's say the most, uh, inventive uh, homework, but I would like you to go through this to realize uh, what can happen if you have a certain arrangement of atoms in a cell that still they can lead to a certain uh, so-called forbidden diffractions, forbidden reflexes. That means the intensity of a scattered beam in that given direction is not zero because of not fulfilling the diffraction condition, but it's zero because actually the diffraction from all individual atoms exactly cancels out each other. Here is an example of a BCC lattice where we have two identical atoms. It means their atomic form factors are identical. And we have BCC lattice. So these two guys sit at the corner of the conventional BCC cell and in the middle of this conventional BCC cell. And now for this two atoms, where F1 and F2 are identical for all of those, uh, for all of the reciprocal G vectors, we once again said that F is actually a function of the reciprocal vector, right? Uh, for all of those, if we look at the structure factor, there will be certain values of V1, V2, V3, defining the indices of the reciprocal lattice vectors, for which the structure factor is identically equal to zero. And this happens whenever the sum of these three is an odd number, because then the intensity coming from the atom in the middle is exactly minus one, which cancels out with the intensity coming from the first atom and the constructive interference, which leads to a destructive interference of these two atoms. And they will lead to, uh, to the structure factor equal to zero. Right? So again, for such diffraction conditions, we get no reflex, we get no intensity, because of the arrangement and type of the atoms, right? Uh, I would like to stress here, once again, the arrangement of the atoms, plus the fact that the two atoms are identical, F1 equals to F2. If we do not have identical atoms, 
So for example, instead of having a BCC molybdenum, we might have here a B2 structure and B2 structure, you might remember from again the first lesson is something which looks like a BCC, but in the middle, it has a different atom. So it's an ordered structure based on a BCC lattice, but with uh, different atoms in the corners and in the middle of the cell. If this is the case, then we have F1 different from F2 because we have two different chemical species. And that means that in this formula, we have F1 from the atom in the middle and we have F2. So the final structure factor will be F1 plus F2 times exponential function of this minus IP uh, V1 plus V2 plus V3, which even for being an odd number means that the total structure factor is F1 minus F2. And since we have two different atoms, this is non-zero. The intensity of this reflection of this uh, diffraction peak will not be great, but will be non-zero, right? So you will still see a certain diffraction, uh, whereas for such a diffraction condition, you would not see any diffraction for ideal BCC material. BCC molybdenum, BCC chromium, which is forbidden by the symmetry of the crystal. And I would leave this FCC example and discussion of that for you again. Think about what uh, what is written here and what does it. How do we arrive at the Bragg's law? Uh, Bragg's law. Uh, we will now consider elastic scattering. Uh, up to now, we haven't discussed whether the length of the wave vectors must be the same. We have discussed only their direction. Uh, so that was all what has been discussed so far. Now, let us consider that we will restrict ourselves to an elastic scattering. That means there is no exchange of the energy and the energy corresponding to the incoming photon is identical to the energy of the outgoing photon, to the scattered photon. And since the energy is proportional to the length of the uh, wave vector, we arrive at the condition that uh, in addition to delta G, equals to, uh, sorry, delta K equals to G. Also, the length of K and K prime must be identical in order to uh, conserve the energy. And when we put these equations into, uh, into the scattering equation, we actually arrive at the formula that we have written here. So it is, uh, only coming from, from the fact that uh, delta K would be written as uh, K minus or K prime minus K. And we say this is equal to G. And how do we calculate now uh, that G prime squared equals K prime times K prime which is equal now G plus K times G plus K, uh, which is equal to G squared, G, G squared plus two times K times G plus K squared again, length. And from the conservation law, this must be equal to k vector squared. So this cancels out each other, and we arrive at the formula that we have here exactly. Right? So this is now we've written the diffraction condition under the assumption that we have elastic scattering. Where does this lead further? <clears throat> 
we now can prove that uh, the interplanar distance is related to the length of the reciprocal g vector. And uh, it can be also shown relatively easily with simple geometry that the g vector is perpendicular to a plane with Miller indices HKL. Right? If you want to, please show that. But essentially, this is the principle of the definition of plane wave. This is a little bit more geometry, but also uh, can, be, uh, can be shown from basic geometric relationships. And when we now enter all of this into the formula, into this formula, we would end, end uh, plus we uh, use the relationship that uh, two pi over the wavelength equals the length of K vector. We arrive at the uh, formula that is known to all of you, the Bragg's law, which is the other formulation of the uh, diffraction condition. Once again, I highlight here that this is true for elastic scattering for the case when we, uh, when we conserve the law, uh, when we conserve the energy. Um, the derivation, how this uh, is related to the Bragg's law, is a simple geometry based on the figure that we have here. And I'm pretty sure that you have uh, seen something like that. Uh, at least during my time, we were doing something like that already at the high school. So I'm pretty sure that you have seen this in other lectures. What I want to highlight here, once again, is that the Bragg's law is identical or is based on our uh, diffraction condition delta k equals g under the assumption of the elastic scattering. This is the key ingredients here. All right. Um, how does it look with the applications? Now, um, when we look at materials, once again, uh, which would be formed of simple FCC structure. Um, and we now, well, it's not actually simple FCC. We look at the V1 structure, which is a double FCC structure, so so-called rock salt structure. So now we can have different, uh, different scenarios. If we look, for example, at the uh, potassium, potassium chlorine, in which both potassium and chlor have very similar atomic form factors, then we would arrive at a similar situation as being in a simple cubic structure in which one can show that certain diffraction conditions are forbidden, forbidden by the symmetry. The same way as we have discussed before for BCC structure. That is the reason why for angles to theta that would correspond to sets of planes with, for example, Miller indices 331, you do not get any intensity here, right? This is not because our um, observation is away from the diffraction condition. No, we have fulfilled the diffraction condition here but we make the observation on a material which fulfills this uh, atomic form factor equality for both atoms. And because of this, together with the arrangement of atoms in the V1 structure, the structure factor turns out to be zero. And to show that this is really the case, we come to a different material with identical crystal structure but different atomic form factors. Now we talk about potassium bromide, where the form factor of potassium and brom are different. And you see that in this, key, in this case, a small, sorry, in the second one, 
the small peaks appear here or even here we have much more significant peak. Uh, this significant peak here is the small peak here. So again, uh, this brings us to the fact that the form factor of potassium on chlor are not identical, but are very similar, right? So the final intensity here was very small. Here it is pronounced. Where it is small, in this case, we were unable to detect anything in the potassium chloride case. And now if we would come to a simple, uh, simple cubic structure, which out of the uh, atomic species, for example, polonium takes such simple cubic structure, then in that case, we would have that, of course, the F1 equals to F2, that these two atoms have identical uh, atomic form factors, both of them corresponding to potassium, and the intensity would be identically equal to zero, both here for the S331, as well as for the 311, it will be indeed the forbidden reflexes, forbidden by the crystal structure. Symmetry. Before we end up for today, let me make a short remark about the difference between X-rays and neutrons. So what we have discussed here was a diffraction of electronic beam of photons now on a certain scattering medium. We need material, we need a medium which interacts with this uh, incoming beam. In this case, the medium were electrons and the electrons uh, have scattered the incoming beams, the uh, waves of, uh, of the electromagnetic wave in different directions. What if we now change a different, uh, different physical uh, quantity that describes our probe? Instead of electromagnetic wave, we now take particles, neutrons, which we know can be also uh, related to certain waves, especially when they are very, very fast. Then we can apply also the scattering theory exactly the same way as we did up to now, with the difference that the scattering medium will be different. Now the neutrons will not interact with the electronic charge, but they will interact with the nuclei with the phonons, with the lattice vibrations. So we have changed the probe from electrons to neutrons, and we have changed the scattering medium from electrons to nuclei. But other than that, the theory itself, the mathematical description remains the same. We again speak about constructive and destructive interference. We also speak about periodic distribution of the scattering medium. Instead of charge density, it's the periodic arrangement of uh, atoms of the atomic nuclei. And therefore, similar laws, or actually mathematically identical laws, would apply also for different kinds of scattering, or for example, this neutron scattering. The point is that then the uh, atomic form factors will be different. The atomic form factor, that is what connected the atomic species with the mechanism of the scattering. We said, which species do we have? That means how much electron density we enter or we uh, provide to the whole material. Plus, then we said it's the electronic charge that causes the scattering. So we worried about the distribution of electronic charge. If you then have a different scattering medium and different mechanism, you change the atomic form factors. The rest of it, the construction of the uh, structure factors, 
eventually remains the same. So coming from X-ray scattering to neutron scattering, in principle, inside of the theory, all what we do is that we change the atomic uh, form factors and the rest remains the same. Now, if you have material which has very different atomic form factors for X-ray scattering and for neutron scattering, then these two techniques can provide very different and, in fact, complementary information about material. And this is why these methods are often used together. The neutrons, however, are used, or the neutron scattering is used in a much lesser extent than X-rays. And the reason is uh, quite clear. Uh, to generate X-rays, we can use the lab, uh, lab sources and pretty much any structural lab has X-ray diffractometer. We do have one here at the, or well, actually a couple of them here at the Institute as well, and plenty of them at the university at different institutions, Eric Schmidt Institute, geology, physics here. Plus, you can also go uh, to higher energy X-rays, of course, uh, to have better resolution, to have a more monochromated source. So that means you have uh, better defined your incoming waves, and you go to accelerators, right? You then get uh, better structural information. But once you are at the accelerators, and you might have also access to the source of neutrons, which are generated uh, due, during the electro rate, uh, during the uh, radioactive decay. Uh, then you might also probe your material with the neutrons and see how the neutrons interact with the uh, vibrations of your atoms. And by this, get information about the neutron diffraction, which is once again based not on the distribution or the contribution of individual species to the uh, charge density, but to the interaction of the lattice vibrations, the phonons, we have discussed last time, with the neutrons. So that's two different waves that interact with each, with each other. Good, this concludes today's lecture. Uh, eventually, what I want you to remember is following. The X-ray diffraction can be used as a proof of the crystalline nature of materials. Since the whole theory, which well describes the observed phenomenon is based on the assumption of crystalline distribution of charge. The, crystalline, the, the periodic distribution of charge is related to the crystalline structure. So the fact that we observe diffraction, diffraction pattern, that we can describe it, proves that the charge distribution is crystalline, uh, is periodic, and therefore we have crystalline material. The condition, the general condition for scattering is given by this formula that the change of the wave vector is equal to the reciprocal lattice vector. However, this is a necessary condition, not sufficient condition to have a non-zero intensity. The non-zero intensity is further on based on how the atomic form factors interact with each other based on their arrangement, arrangement of the species in the unit cell. And that can lead to symmetry forbidden reflexes. Means despite the fact that we fulfill the scattering uh, condition, the diffraction condition, we still get zero intensity for that given reflex. And finally, rewriting this equation, the general diffraction condition for the case of elastic scattering, for the case when the wavelength of the incoming incident and the diffracted beam are identical, leads to a well-known Bragg's law, which puts together the wavelength of our wave. And since the 
uh, energy is conserved, it's the same wavelength for the incident as well as for the diffracted beam. And the lattice spacing of the planes that actually contribute to the diffraction for an angle theta, where the two times theta is the angle between the uh, incident and the diffracted beam, really geometrically looking at where, uh, what is the source of your, of your uh, beam and where the you as an observer stand. 